There seems to be an innate fascination associated with fictional tales with less than orthodox interfamily conflict. One of the most interesting aspects about the Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones series for me involves learning about how the different families function and how tiny or not so tiny differences in motivation between the members might have an impact on future events. Another example would be the latest generation of Fire Emblem games, which is advertised as an emotional and conflicting bunch of stories about family drama. The games didn't end up executing their potential as well as I had hoped, and I really just ended up playing them for the characters and gameplay rather than the plot, but the premise itself was so fascinating to me. It's hard to pinpoint why the concept of interfamily dynamics and conflict is so inherently interesting, but I think that it has to do with the deeply intimate nature of family, and how monumental it is to be at odds with the ones who raised you and that you grew up with, independent of how well or otherwise you were treated. And this is one of the key themes that's explored through Hunter Hunter's Zoldic family, a group that isn't as prominent as the Phantom Troop or the Chimera Ants, and that tends to remain in the background and keep to themselves, save for a few exceptions, but one that has a big impact on the story and characters in its own way. Now, the Zoldics aren't at each other's throats just yet, but there's certainly enough plotting, mistreatment, and motivational differences to make the interfamily conflict within the Zoldics seem relatively substantial. Along with this, I've so far failed to mention that they're a family of world-famous, highly skilled assassins that respond to the highest bidder. And when the highest bidder needs someone to be killed in the world of Hunter x Hunter, huge things are afoot. Combine the business-like fashion of the assassin jobs that the Zoldics carry out with the more intricate motivations of each of the members, and this family becomes truly multi-layered. Each little action can have a sometimes monumental domino effect, and one that may or may not be able to be seen without hindsight. And this is what makes them so compelling. The Zoldic family is so unique in the way that they function, and each member is driven by such different goals, that it's hard to tell where each of these characters' stories are going, because even a tiny change in one of these characters might have a large consequence or conflict. The Zoldic family also contains little hints of quite emotional concepts and themes sprinkled throughout the story and communicated via the characters in lots of subtext. And I'll do my best to point some of these out. Togashi is a writer with an immense attention to detail, and this can be seen not only through some of the world-building tidbits and the Nen rules that he includes, but also through the subtleties of the Zoldics. Like I said, this family are by far the most infamous assassins in the world. They take the biggest contracts and tend to fulfill them with minimal fuss, led by Zeno and his son, Silva. They reside in a manor inside a dormant volcano called Kukuru Mountain, and are very far removed from society apart from their employees. They keep to themselves and are so good at discreetly carrying out their job that any photo of any member of the Zoldic family is worth millions. The children need to be brought up into the assassin business from a young age, so they're subjected to all manner of torture in order to build up a nearly inhuman strength and a tolerance to things like pain, poison, and electricity. It really is a terribly cruel way for a child to be brought up, and while there is some familial love between certain Zoldics, this is usually either unhealthy, as is the case with Kikyo, or between siblings, and the family is generally treated more as a business. The Zoldic children seem to be allowed to express themselves and pursue their interests, but only if they stick to the family's strict guidelines and carry out jobs, with few exceptions other than when it comes to the special case of Kilua. I'm not going to cover Kilua at great length here, or else we'd be here for over an hour, and that's another video for another time. At the same time though, when discussing the Zoldic family, it's essential to mention Kilua's role, because he's arguably the most pivotal member and the root of the family's actions. Every generation of Zoldics has a prodigy, a special child with extraordinary powers that stands out among the rest of the siblings. This prodigy is always given the rights to be the heir to the family business, and it just so happens that Kilua is his generation's heir. His siblings do have some incredible talents, but Kilua towers over them, Predictably, his family gives him special treatment and structure their behavior to try and optimize Kilua's chances of becoming a cold and worthy leader of the Zoldics one day. Kilua's grandfather, father, and mother have him in mind a lot of the time, and while I wouldn't say that all of the other children are necessarily shunned, it's pretty obvious to basically all of the family that Kilua is the important child. This has a gigantic knock-on effect. Due to the older generation being so fixated on Kilua, He's also the focal point for the behavior of not only the Zoldic servants, but all of his siblings as well. Get used to seeing this visual map of the Zoldic family dynamics, because it really is a good tool in understanding how everything functions, and this is only the tip of the iceberg. 
But right here, all I'll ask you to pay attention to is Kilua. As you can see, he's the center of everything. Each of the family members has their own views and feelings on Kilua, and these feelings tend to shape their characterization, being a big reason as to why the children act the way they do. So while Togashi does well in establishing the storied history and far-reaching impact of the Zoldic family business, it's clear that during the time span of Hunter x Hunter, Kilua is the focus. He's both directly and indirectly the root of a great deal of what makes the Zoldic family so fascinating, and a lot of the intrigue associated with them stems from all of the different ways in which the Zoldics perceive Kilua. The servants of Zoldic Manor are tasked with absolute servitude and obedience. It's their life-bound job to carry out their duties with efficiency and without outward emotion. But despite this, it's clear that these servants care more about some of their employers than their job description entails. They form allegiances and pick favorites, and this just deepens the complexity of the Zoldic family. To start, there's Goto, a dutiful butler that does his job without fuss, tasked with communication between the manor and the outside world. He remains professional, but sometimes lets his emotions get the better of him. He has a small rivalry going on with Subone and Amane, is much more sensitive to the needs of Kikyo than nearly anyone else, and cares greatly for Kilua. Enough to consider his orders secondary to Kilua's well-being and happiness at times, and enough to make me pretty sad when he met his fate. Next we have Canary, who's allied with Goto. She initially comes off as pretty heartless and blindly loyal to her employers when she continually denies Gon entry into the manor but becomes moved by his attempts to reach Kilua. Her facade of pure duty fades here, as we see that above all, Canary just cares for Kilua. All she wants is to see him happy. She's more than willing to ignore orders if it means that Kilua benefits, which has ramifications on the plot on more than one occasion. Both of these servants are supervised by Zeno and grew up in Meteor City. This likely means that they were starved of meaningful human affection, and explains why both grew so attached to Kilua when he showed them even the littlest bit of respect. Another important servant is Subone, the elderly woman employed by Silva to keep an eye on Kilua during the election arc. She comes off as quite strict and is fiercely loyal to Silva. She harbors a dislike for Kikyo, perhaps due to her unhinged antics, and says that she simply can't love both Ilumi or Miloki because of how much they remind her of their mother, which is a very important line. Subone does care quite a bit, as she has been shown to treat Alika with kindness, show affection towards Kilua, and become emotional at times. Lastly, we have Subone's granddaughter, Amane. Not much has been given away about Amane, but what is clear is that while she tries to act like the ideal servant, she is far from cold and calculated, and actually has a rather feminine and emotional demeanor, as noted by Canary. She mainly tries to just follow orders and her grandmother's lead, being relatively neutral to the Zoldics. All of these servants aren't instrumental to the actions of the family, but tiny contrasts and differences in motivation means that they are an ever-present element in the dynamics of the famous assassins, and more often than not have a role to play. Maha Zoldik is a mystery. So little is known about this man that I was debating on whether I should include him at all. Maha is Zeno's grandfather and is said to have been an incredible fighter in his prime, with Netero having been the only one to ever survive a fight against him. It's possible that this strength still remains. He's only seen in the series during the assassination of the Ten Dawns with Kaluto and Ilumi during the York New Arc, and is completely detached from any other family member in this graphic, given the basically untouched label. From this, we can assume that he has little to no relationship with the other Zoldic family members, but again, he is such a mystery that it's nearly impossible to tell at this point. Alika is brought into the story during the election arc in a seemingly abrupt fashion, but there is a bit of foreshadowing regarding her existence earlier on through this photograph in the Chimera Ant arc, where Alika is seen facing away in the bottom right hand side. Alika is the second youngest Zoldic, and has an amazing power. She has a sort of split personality with a supernatural being called Nanika, and the pair are able to grant wishes. This power is not as simple as mere wish granting though. There are a large number of rules and implications that go along with the granting of the wish, a lot of which went over my head the first time watching, and some of which I forget even now. The mechanics of this power are as such. After a person fulfills three of Alika's requests, Alika will grant them a wish. She does this by changing into Nanika after the third request is fulfilled. The wish doesn't have to come from the person fulfilling the requests, and Nanika usually responds with a simple K or I, indicating that the wish will be carried out. 
Nanika can virtually grant any wish, even those that seem impossible, but there is a catch. And herein lies the danger of this power. Requests can range from something simple like a hug, to literally being asked to carve out one's organ. The catch is that the bigger of a request that the wish was, the bigger demand or cost that Alika's next three requests will have. And if the next person that Alika asks requests of denies her four times, they and their loved one and possibly more will die. Two people died like this after Miluki wished for a new computer, but if a bigger wish was previously granted, the death cost of the subsequent denied requests could be huge. In one such case, the cost of a gigantic wish resulted in 65 people dying, all associated by some degree to the one who denied the requests. There are further rules as well. When someone dies due to denying Alika, the wish cost is reset. This is the best time to make a wish, as the request demand will be minimal. If Alika begins asking someone for requests, those requests can't be transferred to someone else. So if someone goes into hiding, Alika is harmless as long as she does not see them again. If someone dies in the middle of their requests, it's a failure and at least one more of their loved ones will die. Also, Alika cannot request anything from anyone if she doesn't know their name. Kilua has special privileges due to his relationship with Alika and Nanika, which allows him to have his wishes granted without any consequence or repercussion from past wishes. And the same person cannot ask for a wish twice in a row, unless that person is Kilua. Kilua also knows that some creativity in phrasing the wish can occur, which is a loophole that can allow for more than one wish within one wish. Lastly, if Nanika is required to heal something, it must touch whatever it is healing. Those are all the rules that apply to Alika and Nanika's power. As you can see, it's quite convoluted, but this is likely due to the Full Metal Alchemist-like equivalent exchange rules that apply to restrictions and strength that are prevalent with powers in this series. In Hunter x Hunter, the more restrictions placed on a technique, the more powerful the technique is. This is demonstrated in many points throughout the series, such as Karapika's power and Gon's Dark Transformation, and seems to apply to Alika and Nanika as well. It's an absolutely monumental power that Alika has here, and this makes her almost as much of a focal point as Kilua, with everyone having their own opinions on her. The servants largely sympathize with her, but also have strict orders. Zeno, Silva, and Kikyo seek to control her power, and are quite cruel in their methods of doing so. Miluki just does whatever his parents tell him, Kaluto is jealous of Alika, Illumi wants to both control and harness the power, and Kilua simply loves her. Nanika has a frightening appearance in a monotone, cold voice, but she has been shown to care, and both Kilua and Aluka love Nanika, considering it a dear friend. I'd say that Aluka is comfortably the most important Zoldic other than Kilua, though Ilumi could make a claim. She has so many functions, her original purpose was to heal Gon and save his life using Kilua's privileges, but she also indirectly gives us a deeper glimpse into Kilua's character, gives him a new lease on life by giving him a true purpose, and reveals some even more darkness that resides within the Zoldic family. There are some obviously very dangerous complications that come with being associated with Alika's powers, but regardless, the way that the Zoldics shunned her, refrained from accepting her as a member of the family, and tested out her deadly power on innocence adds even more malevolence to a family that was already quite sinister. They believe that Alika has no soul, when it's clear that she's just a normal kid apart from her power. Alika does all of this and also manages, along with Nanika, to be a sweetheart who did nothing intentionally wrong and simply loves Kilua with all her heart. The scene in which Kilua initially decides to get rid of Nanika, only to tearfully go back on his decision after being convinced by Alika, was one of the most emotional in the arc. There is ambiguity regarding the background of Alika and Nanika at the moment, but there's a pretty solid theory that Nanika is a sort of pseudo-spirit originating from the Dark Continent that ended up inside Aluka. As Jing explains, the Dark Continent is the progenitor of some of the greatest threats known to mankind, the Five Great Calamities. Breon, Pap, Hellbell, Zube, and Ai. It's speculated that Nanika is indeed the Calamity Ai, who is said to be a gaseous life form that is sort of parasitic and codependent, seeming to need a host to function optimally. This would be consistent with the nature of Nanika. Not to mention, I might well be named after a sound that it commonly makes, and we know that Nanika is prone to saying I when it grants wishes. I. I. I personally find this to be pretty convincing, seeing as Nanika's power is literally unlike anything we've seen in the series thus far, and more or less consistent with the way the sheer and unique power of beings on the Dark Continent is described.
Kalito is one of the more understated Zoldics thus far, but he does have quite a bit to his characterization. And yes, he's a boy too. Kalito is a bit unsure of himself and his place in the world, but the one thing that he knows is that he cares for his big brother. This essentially shapes Kalito's character journey. He really isn't too bothered with the family business and decides to join the Phantom Troop, primarily to become strong enough to bring Kiloa back home. Due to his belief that bringing Kiloa back to the Zoldic Manor, a place that Kiloa clearly hates, is a good idea, I'd wager that Kaluto is either not very perceptive or simply insensitive to Kiloa's feelings, which is appropriate and something I'd understand given his upbringing. Also, it's been theorized pretty heavily that Kaluto's feminine nature is a result of his jealousy for Kiloa's love for Aluka. Kaluto sees that Kiloa loves someone that he treats as a little sister and consequently has a feminine demeanor. Now, I don't know if this theory is correct, but it does account for Kaluto's otherwise unexplained envy of Aluka. And if it is true, then it really puts a tragic spin on Kaluto's character. The lengths he would go to simply receive affection from his brother. Kaluto, to me, is a subtle but sad display of what growing up in an environment like this will cause. He's insecure, feels unloved by everyone except his mother, doubts his abilities, and doesn't know his place. Kaluto has had a pretty minor role in the story so far, but I'm pretty convinced that he'll be a big part of the upcoming chapters in the Dark Continent arc. Keeping in mind where Hisoka and Kurapika's stories are going, anyone who has allegiances to both the Phantom Troop and the Zoldic family at this point in the story have the potential to be a huge factor in future events. Miluki has an unusual narrative role in his family. He's cowardly, selfish, and actually really immature for his age. He's all too aware of the imbalance of family focus and is pretty clearly jealous of Kilua. He's gluttonous and spends most of his time watching anime, reading manga, and playing games. On the occasion where he ventures out to buy a copy of Greed Island, he states that he hadn't been outside since he was 10 years old. He is 19 at this point. He probably carries out his killings using indirect methods like drones. Miluki is a coward. He picks fights with Kilua but never wants to truly make him upset and face his wrath, and he obeys his father and grandfather with resentment at times, but without question. He is also quite cruel, as shown when he convinced someone to decline Aluka four times in a row, causing him to die. He just isn't emotionally developed. He's short-tempered and craven, and lives within a comfort zone, which seems strange given that he's an assassin, but also makes total sense if you think about how being overshadowed and tortured must have had an effect on him. Although, there are hints that Miluki is actually pretty perceptive and intelligent, despite his immaturity. He admits that Kilua is special, but says that he's too emotional to lead the family, which is a pretty accurate summation. And Zeno himself proclaims that Miluki is actually very smart, but too lazy and caught up in his own world to achieve anything special. He is very tech-savvy and likely the big connecting factor between the Zoldics and technology, as none of the others seem to spend too much of their time on computers, so he does have a pretty crucial role in the family. Miluki also plays a very big role in terms of tone. In the past, I've talked about how Togashi usually doesn't like to have the tone of an arc or aspect of his stories lean too far one way or another, and how he usually likes to use tools to balance this out. Miluki balances the tone and feel of the Zoldic family. He's mostly a lighthearted character that the audience laughs and pokes fun at, and this adds an element of whimsy and dark humor to a group of characters that are otherwise pretty serious and dark. Togashi not only introduced a fascinating and foreboding family, but through Miluki, he maintains Hunter x Hunter's unique quirky flair, while establishing the Zoldix as something completely different. It's unclear at this point regarding just how Miluki feels about his situation. He could be happy that he gets to be a shut-in his whole life, or he could harbor some resentment and regret that he isn't doing more. Either way, at the moment, he just goes with the flow, follows orders, and does not affect the family dynamics much. I really don't enjoy Miluki personally, and find him to be one of the most unlikable characters in the series, but at the same time I do think that he's a great demonstration, and a less subtle one than Kaluto, of just how broken a child living in his situation could end up, and how unhealthy the Zoldic dynamics are. He sees Kilua's friendships as foreign and wrong, and he didn't become this way by accident. Kikyo is absolutely unhinged. She's possessive, excessive, and overprotective. The interesting thing about her is that she has her children's best interests at heart, but is so extreme with everything that she goes about it all the wrong way. Kikyo clearly loves her family, with the exception of Aluka. She dotes upon Kaluto and loves both Illumi and Miluki, but she's especially fixated on Kilua. 
She is exceedingly proud of Kilua's talent and wishes for nothing more than his success as a master assassin. However, he is constantly smothered by her and cannot afford a second to breathe. She is so overprotective of him that she doesn't want him to get close to anyone and tries to prevent him from leaving the house on several occasions, which really makes me wonder how Kilua managed to enter Heaven's Arena at the age of 6. Anyways, eventually Kilua got fed up and slashed her face when she didn't want to allow him to go to the hunter exam. And instead of being upset, Kikyo was proud at this, saying that Kilua was showing the killer instinct and coldness that he needed to become head of the family. She's just so imbalanced, and probably a big part of the reason that Kilua finally said that he'd had enough. Despite her love for her other children, it's obvious to them that Kilua is the big focus in Kikyo's eyes, which causes them all to react in differing ways. A lot of her behavior is dictated by what will, in her opinion, benefit Kilua, so she doesn't exactly hide this very well. As I mentioned earlier, Suboni says that both Miluki and Ilumi remind her of Kikyo, and this makes total sense. Miluki is emotionally immature and Ilumi is possessive, and it's very possible that both sons got these traits from their mother. It's been said that Kikyo has always wanted to have a girl, but has constantly been disappointed, which is why she raised Kaluto as if he was a female, which is another theory and something of note. I've always had a sort of pet theory with Kikyo. She originates from Meteor City, meaning that she was likely lonely early in life. The servant Goto listens to her troubles and sympathizes with her, perhaps because he too can relate. But regardless, she eventually found some sort of love in Silva, and had a family. Now I think that going from no one to care for, to a full family to love was too drastic a change for Kikyo's mental state. Being overwhelmed with love, but not being used to it may have sent her off the edge into unhealthy affection, and if true, this would add a pretty dark edge to her character. Anyways, it's just a little theory of mine, but I thought I'd share it anyway. Let me know what you think if you want. All in all, I personally believe that Kikyo's unhealthy manifestation of love and need for absolute control is the root of the majority of the problems within this Zoldic family. Silva Zoldic is the ideal model assassin. He's cold, calculated, calm, an absolutely stellar fighter, and does his job. Throughout the series, Silva shows up wherever the job tells him to go, and rarely ever lets his emotions get the better of him. He has very limited meaningful emotional interactions with his children, tending only to speak with them about the business. However, though Silva does not tend to connect with his children that much, he showed a surprising amount of understanding and sentiment in his conversation with Kilua before the latter set out on his adventure. Like his wife, Silva has high hopes for Kilua, but unlike her, he is very much at ease with his son's actions, which causes Kilua to show respect for his father. Except for the occasion where Kilua made off with Alaka, Silva has a pretty relaxed attitude about Kilua, contrary to what you'd think given his character. And I find it interesting to compare and contrast Kikyo and Silva in this aspect. While they both want Kilua to nurse his cold and emotionless nature, a big difference between Silva and Kikyo is that Silva offers Kilua more freedom to explore himself, likely due to believing that it's his son's nature to be an assassin and that all roads will lead to the same destination. He believes that he has instilled the necessary darkness in Kilua due to his teachings, and that his approach to nurturing Kilua's assassin side will bear fruit. Overall, Silva is the template for what the senior Zoldics hope Kilua will be like, but most importantly for the series in general, he is a loose antithesis of what Kilua wants to be. Zeno is the patriarch of the Zoldic family that tends to carry out big jobs with Silva. He's an expert in combat, with his age having not affected his superiority over most opponents in battle. He's a friend of Netero, he cracks a joke every now and then, and while killing is his job, he doesn't enjoy it and only feels pride in the fact that he's good at what he does. He usually won't kill unless there's a reward for it, or unless there's an annoying cheetah man bugging him. Something that I think is fascinating about Zeno is that he definitely has a heart, and tries to avoid killing innocents at all costs. As we see during the Chimera Antark, Zeno will not stoop so low as to disrespect genuine showings of human care, and he is totally against harming innocents that aren't part of contracts. In my opinion, he actually strikes a balance between being efficient at his job, yet retaining some basic human decency. And I know that I'm talking about an assassin here, so keep in mind that I'm talking about human decency relative to the confines of the Zoldics. Zeno is the chief mediator of most jobs, and the supervisor of most of the servants as well. 
Like his daughter-in-law and son, he believes Killua to be special and has high hopes for him. I do realize that assassins can't be classified as regular, decent people, but I really believe that Zeno is the most balanced person in the family. He does his job and no more than is needed. He isn't unnecessarily cruel, and while he is an advocate of some pretty ridiculous customs for his family, he never does anything that one would classify as insane. The Zoldic family dynamics are convoluted and potentially destructive, but Zeno is not a contributor to the complications. In fact, take Zeno out of the equation and I'm pretty sure that the family business will be far worse off. Take both him and his son out of the equation, and there would likely be no family business. Last but definitely not least, we come to a man who is one of the chief causes of the unusual dynamics within the Zoldic family. Kiku is obsessive, Silva is unfeeling, Miluki is immature, but Ilumi's fixation on his little brother is the primary cause of a lot of conflict. And the funny thing is, he absolutely cares for his family other than Aluka, though unhealthily in the case of Kilua, which may be a trait he picked up from his mother. He does whatever he can to protect his family members, even going so far as to offer his own life in exchange for theirs during the election arc. Ilumi is a great assassin. He's ruthless, detached, and carries out his jobs with minimal fuss. He also has an unusual sort of relationship with Hisoka, one that could be perceived as friendship as the two do tend to help each other out, even though the end result in most of these cases ends up being mutually beneficial. Ilumi is generally calm in almost all circumstances, including when he's seriously injured. But all of these traits of his take a backseat when Kilua is involved. Ilumi has a total and complete love for his brother, and this love manifests itself in obsessive and twisted ways. He takes it to another level. Along with his father, Ilumi spent a lot of time during Kilua's early childhood trying to instill a darkness in him, and convince him that he can only find happiness through bloodshed. Ilumi's main Nen power involves manipulative needles, which he can use to alter appearance and control others, among other things. These needles obviously have practical use in combat, but another significant function for them is using them to quote unquote protect Kilua. Ilumi plants a needle in Kilua as a psychological defense mechanism that will force him to run whenever he's facing a stronger opponent, and he also disguises himself in order to keep an eye on his brother during the hunter exam. He legitimately does want the best for Kilua, but the problem is that his ideas of what's best for Kilua are warped, and thus he goes about everything the wrong way. Due to the ideologies instilled in the Zoldic family, Ilumi cannot understand and dismisses Kilua's desire to become close with Gaunt believing in his one-sided viewpoint that it is detrimental to Kilua's development. Ilumi's reaction to Hisoka's suggestion to kill Kilua says more than words ever could of his care for his brother, but he pushes him away more than his mother and forms an even stronger antithesis to Kilua's ideal self than his father. Apart from his strong love, Ilumi is an example of a successful Zoldic, and this proves more than ever to Kilua that he doesn't want to live like this. In times of personal struggle for Kilua, where he tried to overcome the habits of his upbringing, he would repeatedly say things like, I want friends, or I don't want to be like Ilumi. And while these are huge moments in Kilua's character arc, they also add a tiny bit of a tragic element to Ilumi. The irony of Ilumi is that all he wants is to love and protect Kilua, but he's so obsessive, narrow-minded, and extreme in his methods that they actually have the opposite effect. He just doesn't trust that Kilua knows what's best for himself, when in all reality, that trust and freedom is exactly what Kilua needs. I should draw attention to the fact that Ilumi also has another side to his character, a power-hungry, ambitious side that greatly lusts to possess Alaka's gifts. Tsubone reflects that Ilumi's ambition for Alaka's power may even overpower his sense of duty as an assassin. And due to Kilua's special privilege regarding Alaka's power, Ilumi wants to control his brother even more. Ilumi is largely paradoxical. He wishes for no infighting within the family, but is a cause of a lot of it. He loves his family and values his job, but actively hunts down a family member to control and harness power. A time may come where Ilumi has to choose between the side of him that loves his family and wishes for no inner conflict, and the side of him that desires power, and I personally can't wait to see where the story goes. A good amount of intrigue with the Zoldix involves potential, and how the differences in motivations and personality could lead to major events down the road. And no one personifies this better than Ilumi. 
There are so many elements to the Zoldic family that it's a little bit overwhelming to think about repercussions that certain actions can have. Just imagine a major event happening in the future, like Kaluto getting killed by Hisoka, for example, and try to imagine all of the Zoldic-based consequences that would stem from that one act. Then think of the effect that these consequences would have on the entirety of the Hunter x Hunter world. It's truly mind-boggling. This family of assassins is incredibly deep with their dynamics, and a lot of Togashi's insane attention to detail can be found in their narrative design. It's pretty obvious that the story of the Zoldics is far from concluded, but at the moment, they serve as an interesting background element to Hunter x Hunter. They're not the focus of every arc, but they really don't need to be. They're both an intriguing study of family values, favoritism psychology, and the intricacies of free will, and also simply a sort of ace in the hole that the audience must always be thinking about, as they can make their presence felt in the blink of an eye. And more often than not, when any of the Zoldic family feels the need or are required to make their presence felt, sparks fly. Thanks as always to everyone for the support. The Zoldic family was a pretty highly requested topic that a lot of people wanted me to cover, but funnily enough I had never really had a solid grasp of what fans think of them. I do read every comment, so don't hesitate to tell me what you think of them, as I've really not got a clue what the common fan thinks. If you want, you can hit me up on Twitter or my anime list, because I'm pretty active on there. But otherwise, that's all for now, and I'll see you all later.